done with my candidacy. Good morning. Hi, how are you? Then, then you're, I, late. you're late for once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'm... Okay, you're going to you're gonna end up being a ghostwriter. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're, we're talking about a possible book with Steve Levin. Oh, okay. About 10 seconds. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. This is what we were talking about last week, I think. Oh, maybe. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What were you okay. thinking? Yeah, what were you thinking about in terms of a book? Like, oh well, Steve has specific ideas on tensegrity structures, and uh, Susan is trying to extend these ideas to side to side of skeleton. Okay. Yeah. And making a book between Susan and Steve on putting these ideas together. Steve Steve is an orthopedic sur retired orthopedic surgeon. Okay. Well, the person who told me that uh, the ligaments that meet bone gradually change to more bone-like morphology um, or um, stress strain. Um, they, they, anyway, so there's a continuum there. Or impedance matching. I call it impedance matching since uh, my background's electrical. Um, and he has some interesting ideas, like a tensegrity structure. If you squeeze it in one part, the forces that you apply end up being distributed over the whole structure. Okay. And that, that only happens if your tension elements are not uh, elastic. Or they can be slightly elastic. Of course they will be, but... Um, yeah, not, but they're basically nonlinear elastic. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, they are because they're tensegrity object as well. Like the. Anyway, so there's some interesting ideas, and he also claims that Ingber is completely wrong. Who is? Ingber. Oh Ingber. yeah, yeah, the other Ingber. big uh, name. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I've, I've I've known that for a while because Ingber only does. Uh, linear structures and structures that don't change uh, topology at all. Okay. And that's ob obviously unrealistic for real cells. Yeah. So. Yeah, but you can, uh, what I'm going to try to do is change the topology and then measure the stress strain curve and then measure another topology and measure the stress strain curve. Oh, so, so, Susan, do you have the. Uh, URL for the uh, SLAM meeting. I don't know. Yes. yes. Okay, why don't you put it in the chat so oh, okay. that we consider, right. we consider going to it. Yeah. Is this for this week or? Oh, yeah, it's every week at uh, 11 our time. Yeah. All right. And it's a very interesting one. It's called Systematic manipulation of disorder for extraordinary ordinary functionally functionality. Oh, in material. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's often on tissues uh, or it's on soft materials. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So uh, we, Susan and I have been attending this pretty regularly, but she can't make it today. Huh. Oh, yeah, what do you got for us today? Yeah, so uh, I got a, a message from Hari Krishna, and I know that a lot of the people we were working with this summer went on to study and things like that, but he wanted to start to get back into the project he was working on, so the uh, digital microsphere, the, the, the uh, application oh. that he built. And I know Quran also built an application, so there are two applications and we have them here in the uh, there's a on the GitHub uh, repository. We have DivaWorm GSOC 2022, and it's in this uh, directory. And we have both of these. Uh, this I think this one is uh, from uh, Quran. This is Quran's model that he built. So this is his software. And we didn't really ever go over the software in detail after they finished it, but this is. 
Uh, Sorry, I'm getting a little confused. Karan's last name is oh, what? it's uh, uh, Lohan, I think. Um, I need to get those uh, spheres uh, labeled, like my eight millimeter ones, maybe, and put them in my microscope and get them some um, some some sort of um ball with stripes on it so they can yeah, try yeah, their like, uh, I, I need to do that. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the goal. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well yeah anyway so they yeah this is their these are their projects that were well you know they, they have a simple sort of instructional uh, page on this. So this kind of talks about how to use the software on I think that there's a some of the data that you provided they're using it in a sort of a, a sample. So there's like a sample data and you can open it up and, and actually see it in action. But so that, oh. hey, where, is, boundaries like this? where is that? So this, this is, uh, if you go to GitHub and it's in the uh, Diva Worm repository, or yeah, it's in this Diva Worm repository here. So it's github.com slash Diva Worm. And then if you go to this. Um, okay, so is it all lowercase? Yes. Github.com? Yes, github.com slash Diva Worm. Okay. And then if you go to the, if you're there, you go to the repositories tab. At the top. Okay. And then it's this GSOC 2022 uh, uh, directory, which is, I think it's a repository, which is down about five. And then you go in and it's it's right there. So that's, um, that's where they're at. And then there's the digital microspheres uh, directory. And then they're in here. So... Uh, Modeling axolotl embryos, of course, is a Quran's project where he's basically taken the data that you provided, you know, tiled a sphere and you can play with it in that software. And then Hari Krishna's project is a, uh, the same thing, really. It's just a different set of algorithms, which is um, this uh, digital microsphere. Uh, let's see. So that one, this is the readme for that. And his, of course, is a little bit different. He's, he kind of walks through the creation of the uh, model a little bit more than Karan did. But basically, he's taking this mesh, this 3D mesh. It's a sphere, or it's a kind of an oblong sphere, I guess. And then, you know, creating that. And then uh, creating a, something to tile it with. So you have this coordinate system. And then he puts the images over the sphere. And then this is the thing that, that results. So this is the actual screenshot from the software. If you look at the, if you open up the software and you, and you start to work on it, or start to work, work through it, you basically have the sphere in a 3D space. You load the model. And this is just the, the sample data set that he's providing. And so, the, so I mean, you know, it, it, it's functional, it works to some extent, but it's, you know, they can't really do much for it, very much right now. Um, this was supposed to be like a proof of concept. And what he wants to do is he wants to work on like, how do you, what do you use this for? How can I make this better? And, you know, uh, maybe introduce some measures. So in the meetings we've talked about, um, you know, creating some metrics that we can use to measure things across the surface, like, uh, you know, taking uh, the distance from one point to another, finding the centroid of a cell and measuring maybe the geom geometric properties or some of the distances. Uh, and then, of course, there's also cell lineage, but, you know, that's something that might require a little bit more work. Um, and so, yeah, he's interested in doing that. So this is where you're putting data in the sphere and you're loading it up. 
And I imagine there's a lot of calibration work that needs to be done too, like you mentioned, Susan, with the striped uh, uh, spheres and balls that you want to put in the microscope. It would help to calibrate some of this a little bit more. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll try to get that done. That's a Christmas project. I yeah. get time off from my my other things because it's a holiday. Ho right. Holiday. <laughs> hey, Bradley, I've got, got a commercial application. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I play pool with a couple of guys uh, every week. Okay, and I'm not very good at it. Oh. It's become obvious I need a coordinate system on the balls. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now, do you remember the old Google Glasses? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. So if you had Google Glasses that would give you a coordinate system on the ball, then it would tell you what, where to hit the white ball so that you get your other ball in the pocket. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that way, us amateurs could become professionals. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do I need to shut off my, I probably need to shut off my camera. Um, yeah. It's, everything's no, it's okay. It's, it's fine on my end. Find it. Yeah. So, yeah, this is, um, yeah, so this is basically the, just the one data set. And, um, yeah, so I'm not sure how we're going to work on it. I, I have to talk to him yet. But I think, yeah, some of thing, what was that? Why is there a white equator? Uh, I'm not sure why he has it like that, but it could be an artifact of the screen capture he made. But maybe, yeah. But yeah, this. I mean, this. I think this is just the step by step. This is like the kind of shows. Yeah. Uh, what he could do there is be that white equator looks like it's points that really didn't register because they're seen tangentially. Right. But he has neighboring pixels. Uh, so he could use an image processing algorithm that replaces a pixel with the with its neighbors, the value for its neighbors. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that, that might clean that up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like a smoothing algorithm of some type. Yeah, smoothing algorithm or or a substitution algorithm. Right. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. You're familiar with algorithms for uh, fixing uh, defect. Well, these go back from <laughs> to the 70s when this occurred. Right. We had algorithms for fixing defects of, in pixels in your camera because Nobody could afford a camera unless they got an effective one. Right. <laughs> now they're ten dollars. Yeah, <laughs> and they don't have defects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what those kind of algorithms are. Um, yeah, so that's yeah. We'll have to like sit. We'll have to uh, go through it a little bit more and play with it and see because. Of course, when you yeah. add new different types of data, it's you know it doesn't. It necessarily... seems you could extrapolate the structure on the left or right of that sphere uh, into the equator and do a substitution. Okay. Yeah. Something like that. And the problem like here is, I guess he doesn't have an image that includes the equator front on. Right. What's he, how many images are combined here? Just two? Uh, I think, two, yeah, I think these, that's like the one side and then the other side. But of course, there were, I think, in the data set Susan collected, there were like eight where it was like oh, a different yeah. orientation. Yeah, so it might just, the artifact might disappear with the yeah. additional images. Yeah. Okay, but, but it's very good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, and then then you know, uh, and we talked about the features, but I know he didn't have time to to finish them. But to have like an analytical toolbox, where you know you can do different things to the embryo, you can measure different areas of the embryo. You can um, I don't know if you can animate it. I think that would be a little bit too much. 
where you animate like cell division. We didn't need to have like more extensive data to put onto this thing. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, this is trying to think of things like that to do. Well, my, my uh, new microscope is a lot easier to for me to operate. So I should be able to do something. Um, I'm going to send an email to someone who I know raises um, axolotl salamanders and ask her if she can send me some eggs. Yeah. Because they may at this time of year. Yeah. Well, it looks like Kar Karan's then is probably serious about going on with this, huh? Yeah. Yeah. They, they, uh, I mean, you know, they had like. Uh, their schoolwork, like right after the project or the summer ended, so I think they want to yeah. get back into it a little bit. Okay, doc. Uh, Susan, do you have any images that uh, would illustrate uh, contraction wave propagation? I just have the one that I accidentally caught one time of the. Um, there's a furrow. I actually have a photograph of the furrow. Oh, okay. Do you have multiple views? No. It no. was just from the top. Oh, okay. Okay. Because in terms of time lapse, following the uh, differentiation waves would be, would be interesting because there's all sorts of things to analyze about them. Yeah. Well, I hope I can put them in my microscope here and get some images. Time lapse. Well, yeah, some. Okay. I don't have the time lapse automated. My daughter quit on me. Oh. <laughs> Your daughter quit on you. <laughs> oh, I told her to do that part of the project, and she's just like, uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, because she has the background for it. One, I mean, one of the one, yeah, one simple thing is to measure uh, wave speed. Well, it sounds simple. Wave speed versus strain. Okay. Uh, you know, we have the speculation that waves move faster uh, when the strain changes, but <laughs> yeah. uh, or when the strain increases. But we don't know for sure. Right. And that's that's in um. Oh, that's in just the egg or oh no no it, it, as the, it, it, it take a contraction wave any, mm -hmm. any contraction wave I mean, if you take the uh, uh the gas the one that goes and leaves the uh, neural plate behind yeah that's an easy one that that's an easy one it's there's a lot of shape change with it because it changes it actually changes concavity the wave changes kind of from uh, from uh, convex to concave. And uh, if you measure strain by the distance between two cells, you can make a strain map. And then you can ask if the trajectory, the local trajectory of the wave follows the strain map at all. Maybe it's perpendicular to it. I don't know. Okay, so there might, there might be a quantity relationship there but that that would be the beginning of trying to pick apart these differentiation waves in terms of the mechanics okay does the strain map trajectory follow the no the, follow strain, the, map, the, the strain, map is, strain map is not a trajectory it's, it's the it's a map you take a pair of cells yeah the two cells over time cells. And the strain is the ratio of the distance uh, apart between them at different times. Okay. In the meantime, there might be a wave going across the embryo, perhaps between the two cells, if you choose the two cells that way. And so the question is the relationship between the local direction of the of the wave and the amount of strain. And since, since you've got two cells on the surface, that prov provides a vector. So the, uh, the question then is also, is the wave going moving perpendicular to that vector? 
Okay. Can you visualize it yet? I can. Yeah. I'm trying to write it down. Try to write it down. Perpendicular to that vector you said. Which vector? That. The well, take a pair of cells. Any pair of cells on the surface. You measure the distance between them over time, and that gives you the strength. Oops. Oops. Sort of. Well, in difference. Um, so when I click, um, when I take the center of mass, so. I think we lost Dick. Okay, well, we can come back on. I, I want to know the difference in, um, if it's the difference in center of mass. The difference in center or of center mass. So, uh, Well, I mean, I guess you have two cells here and you have a distance. And then you have, uh, I guess, uh, different distances over time. So this, so it could be here. Yeah, it's a string. Yeah. And then the strain. So you've got a, a dot in the middle of it, and is that the kind of like the center of mass of the the part you can see? Uh, yeah. Well, this okay. I meant that to be like. Uh, oh, sorry, I disappeared for a minute. The, okay. uh, my browser, my browser update. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. So, what are you talking about here? So we were just so the, trying to map this out. Yeah. Yeah, so the distance there is, is between the two dots in the middle of the cell there. And I said, is that the center of mass of, or the center of, uh, yeah. A, no, of, a, no, no, center of cell. it's not. It's an arc on the surface of the embryo. Yeah, so. It's, well, the embryo's it's, like top. it's the top of the embryo. Uh, or the, okay, it's the surface the of the embryo. So the arrows are not straight. They're actually the... Uh, the shortest distance over the surface of a sphere between them. Okay. Okay. This so that's the so it's yeah. not the not the top of the sphere. Well, yeah, yeah, we're looking at the top of the yeah. sphere. This the arc distance. Okay. D is the arc distance, and make it D of T. All right. D of T. Yeah. D parentheses temperature. But uh, time, time, excuse me, time. Sorry, pardon? D, left paren, small t, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now D of T is the strain between those two cells. Oh, okay. Okay, that's the definition of strain. And strain is much easier to measure than force because you can just, visual, you can just visualize it. It's a, it's, D, the strain is actually D of T divided by D of T zero. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. So it's D of T divided by D of T sub zero. Yeah. Okay. No, no, the zero goes on the T. Pardon? <laughs> zero goes on the T. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, at time zero, D yeah. Sub, D of T sub zero. Yeah. Right. That's it. That's you. That's the definition of strain. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you can make this. So if you take take different pairs of cells, you can make a strain map over the whole surface. Now you might locate it at the center between the two cells in the middle of that arc. Okay. And that would be that would be that's where you'd put the value d of t over d of t zero. Okay. And that would give you a strain map. Okay, thanks, Bradley, for yeah. drawing it out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, and then the, okay. the waves, though, would be like, would the intersect. Would. Okay, now draw, just draw an arc, another arc purpose, uh, crossing that one. This? Yeah, like that. Okay, right. that's a, let's say that's a wave front. All right. The question is, are they perpendicular? Right, and the wave front can be in any orientation. This one yes, just happens it can be in to any be like Are they perpendicular, and is the speed of the wave front uh, proportional to the strain? Yeah. 
So it'd be kind of like stress strain, yeah. except speed strain. Yeah, speed strain. <laughs> it's, it's easier to measure than stress because for stress we have to measure forces. Yeah. But that's not out of the question. Uh, Wayne Broadland wrote a program that does that. And he's retired and the program has probably disappeared. Yeah. Because <laughs> then the literature off it. Okay. Yeah. Wayne Broadland wrote what? Uh, I think it was called Self-Fit. Oh, yeah. uh, send, me, send me a reminder and I'll send you his papers on it. Yeah, I probably do have yeah, it. He, he took an old idea from when I started at the University of Manitoba. I had a student, uh, Murray Steen. And uh, what he did is blew a bunch of bubbles between two glass plates and uh, the bubbles settled down and uh, what he did is measured the curvature of the bubbles uh, at equilibrium and uh, we showed that there's a relationship uh, basically for the bubbles they don't move so uh, it, it ended up I don't remember what we were measuring, actually, I think, because the forces end, ending up zero because the bubbles aren't moving. But the pressure inside can be different depending on the size of the bubble. Okay, so you get, an arc, you get arcs between the bubbles because it was two-dimensional array of bubbles. Okay, and uh, then he could, we, well, we could calculate the forces, which we showed came out, I think, zero as they should be. Uh, and then Wayne generalized this for a sheet of cells. Okay, so he can, by taking time-lapse movies of, of an epithelium, he can actually calculate the forces between the cells uh, versus time. Okay. Okay. And... I don't know if anyone kept a copy of this program or not. <laughs> oh dear, another GSOC pro yeah. programming <laughs> thing. All good? Yeah. That's from the good old days when you didn't have to put a, your programs in their repository. <laughs> <laughs> Although, well, I would say it would still be here, but it might not work, though. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably like 40 years yeah. old. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, that sounds like a pretty okay. good idea. Yeah. And, okay, so send me a reminder because I'm on a different computer. Okay, yeah. And I'll uh, it goes out. Okay? Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. I'm interested in all of that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I have this. Uh, oh, I probably didn't bring it with me, but I was watching a, a video and someone was presenting on uh, some of the work they were doing in embryos and they came up with this method and it wasn't a spherical map. It was like a, a curved map that they had built. And I can't remember what I have the reference and I didn't bring it to the meeting. I wish I had because it was pretty interesting. So someone had built a uh, taken like data from uh, like a they, they, a light sheet microscopy, and they tiled it onto this uh, continuous curvature. So it was like not a sphere but a curvature. It was almost like a uh, like one of those curved TVs if you've ever seen those. And uh, the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. old ones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, no, the, the big, the new ones where they kind of curve outward. I don't know. Anyways, uh, they uh, basically built a map like this of the surface of this embryo and, and they kind of stitched it together. And so this is kind of reminiscent of the uh, the spherical mapping, but it wasn't a sphere. It didn't have that uh, property. It was just kind of like microscopy images taken, you know, and uh, and then they stitched it together like that. Uh, I wish I had, yeah, there, there was a paper where someone did this, 
Uh, it's about ten years, maybe well, about five years ago, I think. Wait, has that been done for animals? Uh, you know, there's a big picture of an animal from many views. Can you combine them and get a three D structure? Uh, well, they do have like three D video or three hundred and sixty degree video now. Well, they've had that for a while, but like, uh, yeah, you can take see panoramic scenes and you stitch the images together. So you're actually standing in the center of the like the reference frame, and you've just taken pictures of everything around you, and then That's you can stitch them together. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you can do that. You can do it inverse. You can just take like images of something, walk around it, and then stitch it together. So you can just like take it in a viewer and turn it, and it's not and spherical. Is the output, is the output three dimensional? Uh, the output is two dimensional, but you yeah, well, that's a panoramic. yeah, can you make a three? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's just kind of a panoramic okay. view, yeah, so it's not three dimensional, true to three dimensional, yeah. Yeah, I, I ran into that problem a long time ago before any of this came along, but uh, if you photograph. An animal that has a pattern on it, like a zebra or a tiger or a leopard or something like that. And you reconstruct the uh, pattern over the whole surface. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if anyone solved that problem or not. Hmm. And of course, you would have the additional problem yeah, if the animal's alive, it might move. Yeah. <laughs> So you're you're reconstructing it over what kind of surface, like a? Oh well, you recon okay. You're reconstructing the three dimensional surface of the animal where the surface is patterned. All right. Okay. Yeah. Spots or stripes or something, and can you do the whole thing, and then use that to test some of the models of how those stripes or spots occur? Right. right. I mean, the general notion is that they occur with uh, that they're either Turing patterns or they're, they're, they're Turing patterns, so uh, diffusion reaction. Right. Patterns. But nobody's ever tested. I don't think anyone's ever tested that. I criticized some work like that on. Uh, I think there was some kind of angel, angel, marine angelfish, where the. Uh, Patterns changed as the fish matured, hmm. and I showed that. I think I showed that the uh, speed at which the pattern changed was too high, too high for a reaction diffusion approach. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. You know that it might be due to cell migration rather than to uh, chemical migration. Um. When you put the the fish in a um, uh, shaking environment, like a zebra fish, the um, stripes get disrupted. The shaking environment? You mean like as ultrasound? They, no, they were trying a clinostat, and they they put the fish in a clinostat, and then they put the fish on the motor of the clinostat, just test that out. And oh. the, the stripes were disrupted due to the motor on the clinostat, <laughs> not... That's curious. <laughs> yeah. That oh. was interesting. interesting. <laughs> so, so the vibrations of the motor may have been of the same magnitude as gravity, in some sense. And, uh, and the cells may be responding to gravity, then. <laughs> yeah. they, the vibrations that doesn't quite make sense because if you take a an embryonic fish its orientation with respect to gravity seems to be arbitrary oh well, they just they shook it they shook these um, yeah, I, I, didn't, I understand videos. maybe it's a high frequency that's disrupting things yeah okay Whereas gravity would be low frequency. So, okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's interesting. If you, so I guess if I'm understanding you correctly, if you test this in 3D instead of 2D, because a lot of the stuff on reaction diffusion is two dimensional, what I understand. Yeah. You do it in 3D, it may be a different result. Yeah, over over a surface, over a 3D surface. Yeah. In other words, look, there are a lot of people who do experiments. They say this pattern looks like that pattern, therefore this pattern must be caused the same way as that pattern. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's sort of like if you if you take take the shape shapes on a turtle, it looks very similar to that of cracked dried mud. Right. Therefore, right. turtles are cracked dried mud. <laughs> <laughs> You know? Yeah, yeah. Or there are tornadoes on Mars. Turns out the tornadoes on Mars create patterns that are polygonal. They look, they look like cells. Right. <laughs> except, except they're about 40 kilometers wide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you heard of the dust storms on Mars? Right, yeah. They're apparently so continual that that uh, uh, that you can actually see a pattern of these uh, whirlwinds. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, but I wouldn't I wouldn't believe the pattern the mechanism is the same as cells. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Well, hello, Morgan. How are you? I mean, Susan, if you can dig up that paper on the vibration of effects of zero fish patterns, I'd like to see it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> oh, yeah. Morgan said he's doing well. And then Susan posted in the chat about the, the slam meetings, or just the mailing list if you want to join. It's, uh, yeah, I've, I've attended one or two of those meetings, like, on uh, Zoom, they're not bad. I mean, they have a usually have a pretty good speaker and then a discussion afterwards. So, pretty interesting set of topics. Uh, so, let me see. Uh, I do have what I do have here in terms of things. Uh, I have a couple of different uh, papers that. Oh, actually, I think this is the one I was thinking of. I didn't have a. Uh, a folder for it, but this is the paper I was actually talking about. Uh, so this is scientific reports. This is from 2015, so it wasn't that long ago. It's actually been seven years, so uh, time flies. But this is a, a, an ensemble average cell density based digital model of zebrafish embryo. Okay, stupid question right at the beginning. What are they averaging? Uh, I'm not, I don't know exactly. Uh, I think they're averaging. Uh, like some of the cells in the image. I'm not really sure what they're... Well, we'll have to go through the paper. Are they averaging over multiple embryos? Uh, it could be, yeah. They could be a averaging over like multiple scenes or sets of images. And I'm not sure. Okay. But, yeah, so this is, uh, this is from Light Sheet Microscopy, which we've talked about. It just gives you really high resolution microscopy images, they're sort of this bright field uh, as opposed to like a, a fluorescent image or some, some other type of image. Um, so this is the abstract. A new area in developmental biology has been ushered in by recent advances in imaging. Uh, here we have developed a light sheet fluorescence microscopy based framework. So actually this is fluorescence microscopy from a light sheet source. Uh, with single yeah. cell resolution for identification and characterization of subtle phenotypic uh, phenotypic changes of millimeter sized organisms. So, this, you know, this is like uh, inside uh, or the morphology of the zebrafish. So, uh, if you want to do a comparative study, you need to analyze entire ensembles to be able to distinguish <laughs> sample to sample variation. <laughs> uh, an ensemble is like a uh, diff so you basically need to have a number of different zebrafish. That's what I guess they mean by ensemble. So, yeah. 
sample by sample variations. Spawns. What was that? <laughs> they have large spawns. You yeah. Three, you know, simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. Like the a lot of the C. elegans data sets that we've worked with, you know, come from about 300 different worms. Like they'll take yeah. images of them and then average them across the different worms. And because zebrafish exhibit a, a bit more variation than C. elegans, you have to have like uh, more sophisticated techniques for averaging across different specimens. So, um, but they they claim that. To get this sample, to get a handle on the sample, the sample variation you need okay. to have a particular method. Okay, there's a problem with any kind of averaging of a eukaryote. Yeah. Uh, and then it too, I can think of two problems. There was a paper in the 50s that worked with cloned frogs, and every individual had a different pattern. On its surface. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then if you look at the uh, uh, human females or females, I guess of any of any species, uh, they are uh, heterogeneous with regard to wh which X chromosome is turned on. Okay. And it could be in patches. So you can get variation between individuals due to the patches of cells that are in different regions of the embryo being different. Yeah. Okay, and if if one of the X chromosomes has a defect, then it shows up easily. Okay. But this is, uh, so all human females are mosaics as a result of this. Okay. Okay, and I think there's some conditions where it, where it shows up. Right. Yeah. So yeah, in this in this case, they have built a model of zebrafish embryos up to 16 hours of development. Uh, the model is based on the precise overlay and averaging of data taken on multiple individuals and describes the cell density. Oh, here it is. Multiple and it's migration, direction. yeah, direction in every point in time. So they're building, like, I guess a map of this and using that as a sort of a, a way to normalize the data. Um, okay, I'm saying here, mosaicism might screw them up. Yeah, yeah, it would. <laughs> so you have to be careful when you get the, when you come up with a technique for averaging because you have to account for a lot of natural variation. And yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, then the digital model may serve as a canvas in which the behavior of cellular subpopulations can be studied. So they'd give one example where they investigate cellular rearrangements during germ layer formation at the onset of gastrulation. And then having this, uh, because they are using the uh, fluorescence uh, images, they can actually look at uh, gene expression and they look at one-eyed one pinhead mutants. So they look for the expression of one-eyed pinhead, and they, they have mutants of that type of, of mutation. So usually those phenotypes are, usually they're uh, fully penetrant. So you have a similar phenotype across specimens. But, you know, and, and this is, of course, um, you know, this is, of course, you know, restricted to this mutant. So uh, within the digital model of the wild-type embryo reveals its abnormal development at the onset of gastrulation. Many hours of foreign changes are obvious to the eye. So they're actually able to look at like the expression of this gene and some of the other features of the cells to look at uh, some of the changes that occur before you can actually see changes in the phenotype with the naked eye. So this is uh, an interesting pivot. The reason I brought it up is because they actually build this uh, model, this digital model, and then this type of uh, visualization. So this is a zebrafish embryo, of course. Uh, zebrafish embryos are unique in that very early, early in development, they have this uh, pole at the top where you see the cells and then they migrate downwards. And this this end is vegetal. There isn't really much going on down here. But later in development, it fills out and it starts to elongate. And that's what these images are down here.
So they're actually imaging this embryo from like fertilization to 17 hours. So they're capturing all of this variation. So um, this is uh, this is the yolk down here, and this is the top. It's sort of developing from top to bottom, um, and then. Uh, so the, to reveal normal zebrafish morphogenesis during the first 16 hours, we have imaged an ensemble of embryos uh, with fluorescently labeled nuclei, which are the cells that label, you know, in the, in the nucleus, you see these spots, which represent the cells. And then you, if you have different things that you label within those nuclei, you can actually identify what cells are. So Bradley, they do not label, they can't see the cell-cell boundaries. Uh, well, it looks like the it's it's kind of they have these uh, nuclei. They don't really image the boundary. Like they don't put a marker in the membrane or in the, at the at the edge of the membrane. I mean, I know some people have done this in studies, but yeah, they don't. They're not really marking those boundaries in the same okay. way they're marking the nucleus. Oops. So uh, let's see. Right, so there's that. Then you just have a map of the number of cells, surface con coverage. Um, okay, so this is the thing here. This is where they align the cell coordinates. So they're aligning the cell coordinates along this model, this uh, spherical model. And... Uh, There we go. Uh, this is the animal pull, vegetal pull. So they have the orientation of what's going on here, ventral dorsal. Then they have this three-dimensional model. Then they map this sort of to a, a, a spherical model like this, the top view, side view. So they actually show these things. They show the embryo position and the coordinate system that they're using. Then they stretch it out, actually. It's interesting. They don't build a spherical model. They take, they have the data in a sphere, so they're imaging, like you know, through the embryo, and then they're mapping it to these, uh, like these sheets, they're these extended sheets, I guess. They're these two dimensions. Are those Mercator projections? Yes, yes, I think they are. Which okay. I think we've talked about being somewhat problematic for, you know, if you want to look at things towards the poles, they're distorted. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is where they take that sphere, they pull it into a two-dimensional uh, sheet, and then they look at things across the surface. So it's like, you know, if this were a, a map of the world, you know, the Americas would be here, and then Eurasia would be here, you know, Africa would be here, and then your your uh, Antarctica would be down here, but it would be severely distorted. But they what they do is they basically take it and they look at but the, the power of this of course is that they can look at different uh, uh, sides of the sphere and they can put it into a coordinate system that you can look at linearly so you can actually visualize it like this so you can look at comparisons between the AP versus the VP here animal versus vegetal pole so you have things being expressed here that aren't expressed here you have things that are patterns that are emerging uh, in the vegetal, but not in the animal pole. And then this is the equatorial region here, which is along this edge here on the sphere. So, you know, if you built the sphere... What the colors correspond to? I think these are the markers that they're using. So uh, E is actually um, 2D maps of integrated cell nuclei density. Uh, actually, they're using a... I think they're actually using a different, they're not using a, a Mercator projection here. They're using a Gall Peters projection. So I don't know. Uh, they're, they're you know, using different types of projections for this. But this this is supposed to be cell density here, this map. And then D is, um, uh, so this is where they're actually uh, coordinates from a single embryo on a 2D map using azimuthal and elevation angles. Uh, and then this, this is just the cell nuclei based on that. So this is like a, 
uh, looking at the different uh, orientations of the cells. And you can see that this is in radians, this is in radians, these different uh, parameters that they're using here. This is elevation versus this parameter in radians. So they're building these, um, these maps based on different transformations, different projections. This actually shows then over time, you go from six to 16 hours. So you can see these different changes from animal to vegetal pole. So, you know, that's in zebrafish uh, embryogenesis, that's an important distinction between those two poles where you get like everything going on in the animal pole and then things happening in the vegetal pole over time. You can see this on a sphere. Bradley, how many cells are they dealing with? Uh, I think in this period of development, it's on the order of maybe hundreds to maybe 1,500 or so. So oh, that's all? Yeah, oh. it's not that many, but it's more than, say, like C. elegans. Uh, but, yeah, you don't have that many cells that early in zebrafish development. Okay. And uh, yeah, so this is their ensemble average, average digital model. I think the take-home here is that they're building these flat maps. They're using a projection. They're taking, like, basically imaging. And they, they're imaging a sphere. They're not making a, a sphere or treating the, the uh, surface as like a thing that you can explore spherically, they're actually building these flat maps that then show these distinctions. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's, um, I, I, I thought that was pretty interesting. I thought, oh, that's interesting in light of our stuff on, uh, <laughs> on our spherical maps. Uh, well, they, they have coordinates of each new uh, What do you mean? Like just... Defining different raw, parts. Raw, raw, yeah, the raw data can give the coordinates of each nucleus, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. So there are different data sets where you can do this. Uh, they have. Uh, okay, so therefore, therefore, you should be able to do three D. Yeah, yeah. They should be. It should be possible to do it. I mean, I think there's a data set from the Keller Lab at um, Genelia, and they've done a lot of work with. Uh, zebrafish uh, embryo modeling, or they've actually, you know, have the 3D data set where you have a three-dimensional coordinate for each cell okay. at different times. And um, so, I mean, that, that can be done. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, um, you know, I, I think you have to do some work on like making it into a spherical model. It's not as simple as this because it's just the nucleus or the centroid of the cell. So they just put yeah. a marker in the nucleus or the centroid, and they and you just pick that up with uh, yeah, cell tracking. Yeah. So we used to call it cloud maps. Yeah, yeah. And then there's some issue with like if you're trying to track individual cells, like in zebrafish, you can't really track, or at least the way the data sets are constructed, you can't really track individual cells. You can track like uh, the cells that exist at a certain time. So it would be a little okay. difficult to. Um, okay, now, uh, one thing, let me point out, uh, I played around with an idea a long time ago, trying to represent three dimensions. Uh, I think it was on a storage tube uh, uh, terminal, <laughs> okay, <laughs> if you can remember those. <laughs> yeah, they were like etchy sketches, you could draw once and then erase the whole thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So what I did is I took a cloud pattern representing density in three dimensions and made two different views of it, separated by about six degrees, and then viewed it as a stereo pair. Okay. Okay? And believe it or not, it worked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your, your eye can actually match up corresponding points and see the thing as a three-dimensional structure. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so that's why I said it's the, what they've got there is similar to cloud maps. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what they call anaglyphs, which you can make. There's a software you can make them where you take two images and you overlay them. You have to have like a transparency, overlay them by about that many degrees. You can play with the degrees of separation, um, and it gives. Actually, it's interesting because it gives you different perspectives on it 
Like you can get yeah. a little bit more depth or a little bit less depth. Yeah, yeah this, this business, if you have the 3D data, even though it's density data or columns of points, you can still observe it as a three-dimensional structure with a, as a stereo pair. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. An old technique. We we used to also have there. There's a guy named Richard uh, Feldman uh, who uh, built a box which you could put on your screen so you could see the two images overlapped without straining your eyes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. And you can also make them in two colors and then wear the yeah, wear the red yeah. glasses. Red, green glasses, yes. Red, green glasses, yes. Red, green still, glasses yeah. yeah. Yeah, you have to steal them from the movie theater. <laughs> <laughs> now I'd like to talk about something called the hourglass model. It's something we've talked about in past meetings, and it's actually not relevant to zebrafish or to C. elegans. But we're going to be talking about different types of vertebrate embryos. And so this is a paper that came out a comparative study of the hourglass model of development in these different organisms. So to briefly summarize what the hourglass model is, it, it, you know, if you can imagine the developmental trajectory going in this direction, um, so we'll call it developmental time. And down here we have fertilization of the uh, of the egg. At the top we have sort of the adult, or maybe like a uh, a phenotype that resembles the adult. Uh, actually, just uh, after birth, maybe is a better way to put that. And then we have this hourglass in between. And so the hourglass represents the amount of variation that you see in development. So for fertilization up to what we call a phylotypic stage of development. We have a lot of variation in the embryo, uh, a lot of different processes going on, uh, a lot of different pathways being taken. And then when we get to the phylotypic stage, which is here, uh, things even out across different types of uh, embryos. So you actually have uh, the famous pictures of embryos where you see them and you can't tell whether they're a horse or a human or a chicken. So this is, uh, the reason they call it phylotypic is because it's typical across phyla. So at that point, the embryo is very similar across different phyla. And then after that point, you go back to having, observing a lot of variation and indeed observing the different forms that take the shape of the different phyla of uh, vertebrate embryos. So you have your horse, you have your human, you have your, um, uh, frog, you have your different types of um, organisms or phyla that you see in the adult form. So that's what this is about. And this is a very common model in Evo Devo. If you're familiar with Evo Devo, this is something that is sort of the underpinning of Evo Devo is that you have this phylotypic stage where there's the similarity across taxa or across phylum, and then there's a divergence. And developmental change will occur here in this phylotypic stage to change the trajectory of these different uh, embryos. But of course, there's a lot of variation happening before the phylotypic stage, um, but that's not in, in the form itself necessarily. So uh, this paper that I'm going to talk about is about hourglass models, the time-aligned hourglass gastrulation models in rabbit and mouse. And so in this paper, they're gonna talk about this type of model that they're uh, working on this, this uh, theoretical model, and they're going to talk about it in rabbit, and they're going to talk about it in mouse, and they're going to make a comparison. Uh, this is a bioarchive preprint, so it's, it's uh, fairly recent within the last month or so. Um, so let's go through it. So the abstract reads, the hourglass model describes the convergence of species within the same phylum to a similar body plan during development. So this is actually where you get within the same phylum, which in this case is, uh, is vertebrates. Uh, yet the mole molecular mechanisms underlying this phenomena in mammals remains poorly described. So everything I was showing you there talks about sort of these changes, uh, molecular changes at the uh, below the sort of the constriction of the hourglass 
morphological changes above it. And then in that middle section, you get a convergence. Um, here we compare rabbit and mouse time resolved differentiation trajectories to revisit this model at single cell resolution. So a lot of the, this, this model has been largely considered to be a theoretical model. You can observe it in different data sets. But we, what we're doing, they're trying to do here is trying to build, uh, bring it down to single cell resolution and understand how these changes occur at the single cell level. We modeled gastrulation dynamics using hundreds of embryos sampled between gestation days 6.0 to 8.5. So in these embryos, that's a pretty early stage. Uh, gastrulation being uh, sort of the, the time window that they're looking at here and compare or the process that they're looking at and compare the species using a new framework for time resolved single cell differentiation flows analysis. Um, we find convergence towards similar cell state compositions at E7.5, underlying by underlied by quantitatively conserved expression of 76 transcription factors, despite divergence in surrounding trophoblast and hyper, hypoblast signaling. So this is signaling within these uh, tissues that are not organs, they're not you know different regions of the body. They're still kind of regions of the embryo. So trophoblast and hypoblast. Are different regions and you get signaling uh, within those areas that are starting to diverge as you're starting to get differentiation of those um, tissue layers into other types of structures. However, we observe noticeable changes in specification timing of some lineages and divergence of primordial germ cell programs, uh, which, which in the rabbit do not activate mesoderm genes. So this is at the single cell level, so you're starting to get different programs in different cells. As those cells are part of differentiated tissues, those cells differentiate in terms of their fate. You get these programs, as they put it, that change their function and diverge from one another, which in the rabbit do not activate mesoderm genes. So this is like something that in the rabbit, you see a difference from what you see in the mouse. Comparative analysis of temporal differentiation models provides a new basis for studying the evolution of gastrulation dynamics across mammals. So they talk about early mammalian development following this generally conserved sequence of events. Uh, you get this uh, evolutionary hourglass effect. Uh, the process of gastrulation involves the formation of, of the embryonic germ layers from pluripotent epiblast and laying out the basic embryonic axes. So there's this process that happens that's very, um, very much conserved across different embryos. You get this uh, this basic uh, induction of shape, and you get this basic induction of different uh, differentiation of different types of cells into different germ layers, and then into beginnings of, of starting to sort into different tissues. This critical stage of development has been mainly characterized in the mouse model, in which the developing blastocyst takes on the form of a cup shape or egg cylinder, and so this is our um, our process here, gastrulation. We're getting this um, sh change in shape. It's it's uh, becoming sort of a you know instead of having a sphere, you have or an oblong sphere. You start to have a distinct shape. Uh, that's sort of the formation for the rest of the morphology. The mouse gastrul is, however, highly distinct among vertebrates, as most mammals begin gastrulation as a planar embryonic disc. So the process of gastrulation in mouses is quite different than the rest of uh, uh, vertebrates uh, for whatever reason. And so, it's, you know, we built this uh, theoretical model on a model organism that is atypical. So that's their point here. Such gross structural disparities expected to have dramatic effects on gastrulation by shaping cellular mechanics and spatiotemporal interactions. And so these things uh, can vary early on before the, the, we go through this hourglass. After the hourglass, there is divergence, but it's more about species-specific differences. Of course, in this case, we have a very uh, very fundamental species-specific difference. So that's an interesting point. This is why they're doing this uh, comparative study. Uh, moreover, wide variation has been observed between species in relation to implantation strategies, which is where the embryo implants itself into the wall of the uterus, as you know, in in the cases here that they're looking at, 
they're talking about live birth uh, organisms. So this and the development and orientation of the extra embryonic tissues. So this is something that we're also interested in in terms of the variation that exhibits. This is early on in development before gastrulation with respect to implantation, and this is more of this variation at the bottom of the hourglass. Uh, the rabbit stands out among possible alternative mammalian models by presenting many of the advantages of the mouse, uh, namely the short, relatively short gestation and large litters that can be accurately timed. So you want to pick an organism that's very similar to the mouse, but is different from the mouse, and so the rabbit is this uh, candidate. Uh, the rabbit also uh, is more closely resembling of human development, uh, in particular with respect to the specification of primordial germ cells. And so this is, again, sort of justifying this comparison. And so they use single-cell transcriptomics for this, uh, where they're able to map a lot of these single cell changes uh, between different types of cells and look across these different species and see what kinds of transcription changes, transcriptional changes occur and are different between. Uh, this results in comprehensive, it's result in a comprehensive atlas that greatly enriches and refines previously, uh, previous imaging based data by characterizing precisely transcription programs at high cellular re resolution. So with uh, single cell transcriptomics, they can be mapped to uh, single cells. So you can actually take an atlas, an anatomical atlas, look at the cell, and then have the transcriptomic uh, profile that you can lay over those cells. And you can actually look not only between species, but between cells and see what kind of variation is being generated there. Um, so then they, they merge these inferred cell states that are uh, gotten from the transcriptomics data into a manifold model, which is something that they introduced in the paper. It facilitates the inference of cellular differentiation dynamics using computational tools that search for parsimonious differentiation trajectories. So these are these different trajectories that I was talking about early on. These are largely transcriptomic and um, but we want to be able to characterize these in single cells and then across species. Um, so let's see if we have any uh, juicy parts to this paper that are particularly interesting. Um, so uh, manifold alignment uncovers highly conserved gastrulation states in rabbit and mouse. So they've created this manifold construct um, then they're able to examine the differences between rabbit and mouse, and they find that there's this highly conserved uh, set of gastrulation states between the two organisms. So given fully time resolved manifold and flow models for rabbit and mouse gastrulation, we wish to define a framework for their principal comparison. Um, so basically, so figure uh, supplemental for A and B, which I'm not sure we have the supplemental materials in here, but um, Basically, you're taking these manifolds and you're comparing them, and that's, that serves as a comparison for development or gastrulation in the two organisms. And they found that there's actually this uh, a similarity between all metacells in the two manifolds, identifying 79 reciprocally best orthologous metacell pairs. So these metacells are the cell, the anatomical cells with the transcriptional data. Um, and then uh, notably, the identification of such states is a, high, in a, a highly non-trivial result, showing that the two manifolds are indeed alignable over a very rich collection of transcriptional states. So again, you can make this, uh, these, these similarities across. So a lot of times uh, transcriptional states or transcriptional uh, sites, I guess the activity of different transcripts will vary, and it's very hard to interpret you know, how similar or different they are. Um, by doing this kind of approach, you can actually see, you can cut through the noise, as it were. Sometimes the, the variation in transcript levels is due to noise, sometimes other things. But you can actually figure out what things are in common here using this type of technique. Um, there's a lot of detail here that I'm not going to go over. But I, I want to talk a little bit about maybe some of the things that they're doing here. Um, so they basically have this network flow model 
attracts rabbit gastrulation dynamics in absolute time. Uh, to infer differentiation model from the single cell and single embryo rabbit data set, we use an improved version of our network flows algorithm, which was initially demonstrated in the mouse. So this is uh, citation 14, which um, is, you know, have a link to the citation. But so this is in the method section, which we don't, I don't know if we have access to in this uh, uh, main paper. You can look at it later if you're interested. The algorithm resolved differentiation flows for metacells distributed over the 12 time bins, balancing similarities between expression states and estimation of cell proliferation rates. So this is something that we get in this differentiation flow. Uh, the latter was performed by computing co-expression of S phase and M phase related genes and quantifying a distinctive non-proliferating cell subpopulation. So they're able to actually uh, build this from this network flow model uh, they're able to track some of these dynamics of gastrulation, map them to a time course, and then it gives you an idea of what's going on. And of course, since you can do this for each organism, uh, it works in both rabbit and mouse, and you can compare across the organisms. And so, you know, this is just about estimating things like uh, non-dividing cells per cell state and time. You can use that to calibrate growth rates. Um, and different aspects of this flow, which is the flow of, I guess, cell migration and, and uh, cell division. They're, you know, they're treating it as, as a flow, a network flow. Um, and so, yeah, th this is kind of goes over how they applied this technique to the different embryos and some of the variation in the embryos that you have to deal with in this modeling exercise. Uh, redefining rabbit embryonic stages by integrating morphology and transcriptional analysis. This is where we're kind of building this model. So this network flow model really derives from, um, so to describe rabbit gastrulation on an absolute temporal axis, we perform morphology-based ranking of the embryos and ranking by KNN similarities of single cell profiles. So this is where you're getting uh, both a morphology-based ranking of embryos and a ranking of the single cell transcriptional profiles, and you're trying to fit them together into these me measures. So uh, this, is, this is, again, like this is just kind of referencing the methods a lot. So there's a lot more detail in the methods section, but they're basically building these network flow models from these normalization procedures. Um, so let's see if I can find some images. That's actually would be interesting. Um, but this, when you align the rabbit and mouse gastrulation time axes, it highlights this hourglass like bottleneck. And so this is this bottleneck that I showed in, in this image here. This is considered to be the phylotypic stage. And again, this bottleneck is where everything kind of converges for a while in development and, and aligns. And then you get this more extensive uh, phenotypic variation instead of molecular variation uh, down the the bottom of this. Uh, so following alignment of the rabbit and mouse gastrulation manifolds, we next saw the principled strategy for comparing the two differentiation processes as represented by our models. So we want to understand this larger process rather than some of the uh, differences, you know, trivial differences between the organisms or between different cells. We therefore tested whether the independently determined rabbit and mouse gastrulation clocks could be aligned to our common time axis. So they have, we're looking at these time courses, we're looking at things going on in the uh, growth, different growth rates, and they're not, you know, rabbit and mouse gastrulation don't exactly operate according to the same sort of tempo, as it were. So you have to align them over a common time axis. To eliminate potential cell type annotation bias, we, get, uh, we generated a unified representation of rabbit mouse cell state distributions. And in this manner, computed cross-species embryo cell state frequency similarities over time. So they're actually taking the two data sets and this gastrulation process, they're kind of merging it into a single time frame. So, you know, mouse and rabbit, you can make a direct comparison between what's going on at different time points. And all organisms have this difference in the sort of the way that development unfolds. Sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's slower. Sometimes this is due to the rate of cell division. 
Sometimes this has to do with what they call heteroprony, or the rate of growth of different structures. So there are these different aspects of the clock that uh, I think gastrulation are dealing more with cell division uh, exclusively. But there, there's a difference between or, uh, different types of organisms. So this uh, the resulting similarity matrix that they build from these cell state frequency similarities reveals a stereotypical structure, which pre-gastrulation states are aligned but not synchronized. So they're aligned. They're not necessarily synchronized because it would be rather hard to do. Rather, they're aligned. So they're doing an alignment procedure here. This leads towards a bottleneck at approximately uh, 7.5, or what they call E7.5, which is basically uh, days after fertilization in both species, followed by a more synchronized gastrulation process with potential gradual loss of coherence. So you have this uh, initial uh, gastrulation process, which actually there's a bottleneck here. You have pre-gastrulation states that are aligned but not synchronized. You have this bottleneck at 7.5 days, uh, and then followed by a more synchronized gastrulation process. So this is this phylotypic uh, stage with potential gradual loss of coherence. So that's when you move up into the top of this uh, hourglass and towards adulthood or some juvenile state that's not in the in utero. Uh, right. This analysis shows that overall we can use the absolute time axis of the two species for comparing the gastrulation processes. It also clearly demonstrates divergence and compensation in some key stages, particularly highlighting the early and more gradual emergence of PS populations in the mouse. So these are uh, cell population. Uh, although, remarkably, although the rabbit PS emerges later, it then converges to embryonic frequencies that closely match those observed in mouse. Okay, so this is um, I'm looking for some extra images. Um, so they have a lot. Of, oh, they actually, this is the methods here. So you know, these methods you can go through them at your leisure. It's not uh, something you know. I don't want to spend too much time on that. I'm not sure we have any images in here actually. Oh, here we go. Okay, so figure one has uh, this shows gestation time here, developmental stage, corresponding mouse stage. And I believe this uh, figure A is very complex. Actually, I think these are just different uh, images stitched together. So this is figure one here. This is very complex. Uh, this shows the cell type fraction here over the different days. So this is cell type in the embryo. The, these are the somites, the map of the somites. And this kind of tells you what's going on here. So you have down below, you have the AP symmetry break, posterior gastral extension, constricted PS, defined node, robust endoderm and ectoderm, notochordal plate, Prominent head folds, caudal epiblast, cellular diversification, somite stages, embryo elongation, cardiac crescent neural tube. So you can see that this is the time here from day 6 to day 8.6. You have these different events going on here. You have somites, the number of somites. Uh, and then you have this uh, cell type fraction, meaning that you have, you start with this uh, gray, this brown, uh, color here in the, in the chart, which is epiblast. So all the cells are epiblast at day six, and they become more diverse over time. It's actually around 7.7 .7 days onward that you get a lot more variation all of a sudden. So this is where you're kind of, this is maybe like the, the phylotypic stage in here, and then we pop out of that and we end up diversifying. So this is an interesting sort of map where it shows this, this variation over time. This is their uh, flow map, their flow network, where they show the different cells and the cell types. So this is a network of those. And then you can see the uh, microscopy image of the embryo, where they show how the embryo is changing shape and differentiating over the same time period. Uh, that's figure one. Figure two actually shows, it looks like, uh, 
an expression matrix where you have these expression levels over that same time period, six days to 8.6 days, and then mapping it to this heat map, which shows a relative expression of different actual genes, um, genes that are important in development. So you can have you have this map of gene level, uh, gene expression level over time, and it maps to this uh, expression matrix. So that's uh, from sort of the level to the relative expression. Uh, this figure three just shows like different cell types. Again, it shows a, an expression matrix, but then it shows sort of like what cells are being expressed at what time in development. So PGC is uh, has a low correlation with, uh, I think they're, this is actually within the cell types, what their correlation is. And you can see that the higher correlation is for some of these neural, uh, in some of these neural cells or cells in these structures here. Or, or actually it's uh, the genes that are associated, I think, with some of these uh, functions that are more highly correlated. So PGC is low, uh, low correlation, relatively speaking. And then some of these other uh, more specialized cells for the uh, neural tube and the forebrain and the caudal neuroectoderm, rostral neuroectoderm, those things are more highly correlated. So it's, it's an interesting plot. The thing about uh, gene expression profiles is that they're very hard to interpret. Even in context, it's really hard to say like what this means. Um, so this is another map here of different types of, uh, this is rabbit versus mouse cells. So this is expression of these different uh, genes in different structures here between rabbit and mouse. You can see that there's a, a relationship here. Um, and then I don't know if this is, the rest of this isn't necessarily that interesting. It just shows a lot of this proof of concept for some of the gene expression profiles across this developmental time window. So from six days to 8.25 days, you get these different trends. And they're different for rabbit and mouse, um, but this is, it'd be expected. Uh, some of these cross-species comparisons, again, are pretty hard to make. You have to make a lot of uh, assumptions about, you know, how to normalize the data. And then you can actually look across, but, but the benefit is you get a window into some of this variation. So, you know, you can do really interesting studies by looking across different species and getting a sense of, you know, what kinds of things they have in common, what kinds of things are different. And then you can say things, you can uh, appeal to a uh, theoretical model like the hourglass model to interpret your result. So thank you for joining me. Hope you learned something. Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, is there anything else you want to talk about today? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking of trying the idea of a journal club for the Breast Cancer Project. Okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'd ask you to do it, except I don't think you know. I think the place to start is with computer tomography algorithms. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I suspect that topic would take a while for you to get into in depth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that my, my expertise area? So. No. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to send out a broadcast message and see if anybody's interested. Okay. Okay. I'm interested in the 3D imaging. 3D? Oh. <laughs> 3D algorithms because um, optical coherence tomography is uh, 3D. Oh, okay. Maybe I should add you the list then. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it can be for people interested in tomography you know, with x rays or infrared light. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, it might be some feedback to back from that field anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I could probably present on something. I mean, I don't know. It would have to be something I know fairly well, so. But, um, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's like, well, it would be topical. Well, I, have, I have a list of around 30 papers to start off. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so... 
So we'll see. There are various techniques of what's called limited view computer tomography. Okay. Oh, did you make Heidner hair of my niece's um, Erica Franzman's um, paper that I sent you? Uh, anyway, she's looking at nebula yeah. from one side, obviously, and calculating what they look like due to the magnetic field lines. Like you can make some extrapolations as to what the magnetic field lines look like in a nebula. So she's okay. done that. I, I sent you a paper out of the blue. I said, why you sent me a paper, but I don't remember being described that way. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it's just a, a one sided image. Right. Trying to make a 3D object out of a one sided yeah. image. I spent the last week proofreading a 500 page book. Oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so, if so you wanted her to yeah. give a, a talk of, about what she's doing for your journal club, maybe she could. Well, look, I'll, I'll put together a message sometime today and you let me know if she should be in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Because. Uh, well, most of the people in the breast group are involved with computer tomography with limited data. Right. Oh. Okay. Yeah, well, this is limited data that <laughs> okay. my niece is dealing with, yeah. Okay. Okay, though. Right. All right. Well, I, sh I should go now. Uh, people yeah. are okay. want to leave. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you have to get on the plane so you can get out of the cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. All right. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.